Welcome to Lecture Online, and now let's take a look at the objects in our solar system beyond the eight planets, the dwarf planets, also known as the trans-Neptunian objects. What are they? Well, remember, Pluto was discovered in 1930. Charon, the big moon of Pluto, now we know that Pluto has more than one moon, was discovered in 1978. And then after that, we began to find other objects like Pluto further out away from the sun. And so those are called the trans-Neptunian objects because they're past the orbit of Neptune. Pluto, as an exception, for a short period of time during its orbit, for about a year or so, it actually comes within the orbit of Neptune. It actually crosses over, and for a short period of time, Pluto is closer to the sun than Neptune. But that doesn't happen very much. And so out of its 248-year trip around the sun, only about one year or so is spent, or about two years is spent, inside the orbit of Neptune. Now, what are their relative sizes? Well, you can see, and let's go through the list first so we can become familiar with them. In order from closer to the sun to farthest from the sun, and that's of course the average distance, because Pluto really, the distance between the sun and Pluto changes from about 30 astronomical units to as much as 50 astronomical units, so that the average distance is about 40 astronomical units. So we have Pluto with its large moon, Charon. We have Haumea, which is at 43 astronomical units. Quayar, which is slightly further, 44 astronomical units. Makimaki Maki at 46 astronomical units, and Aries, the biggest of the trans-Neptunian objects, at 68 astronomical units. And then there's one called Sedna, which has a very elliptical orbit that's as far away as 489 astronomical units on average. Relative size, notice that Pluto was the largest for a while at 2,274 kilometers, compared to the Moon, was about two-thirds the diameter of the Moon. Notice that Charon is a very large moon compared to uh, Pluto. It's about half the size. Haumea, a little bit bigger than Charon. Quayar, Makemaki, and then finally Eris at 2,900 kilometers across, which was bigger than Pluto. We actually found another object out there bigger than Pluto and almost as big as the moon. And then we had Sedna, which is about 1,600 kilometers across. Notice that Eris is so far away, 68 times the distance between the Earth and the Sun, that it takes Eris about 560 years to make one trip around the Sun, and Sedna, being that far away, takes more than 10,000 years to make one trip around the Sun. Notice what's unique about these as well, is if you look at the orbital inclination relative to the ecliptic, notice that all of them have deviations from the ecliptic greater than the than Mars, uh, not Mars, but Mercury, which has the greatest deviation from the ecliptic of all the eight planets. Mars is about seven degrees of the ecliptic plane, and Quayar is eight degrees. That's the smallest difference. Notice that Pluto and Charon, of course, have the same at 17 degrees. Haumea at 28 degrees, Makemake at 29 degrees, and Eris varies at 44 degrees. So when the ecliptic plane is like this, Eris goes around the sun at an angle of 44 degrees relative to the horizontal ecliptic. And then, of course, Sedna here is back down to 12 degrees. But all of them are quite a long distance away from the ecliptic. So we assume, though, that these bodies, they're in the copper belt. And the copper belt is not a flat ring around the solar system. The copper belt is actually like a donut-shaped object that has objects that are far above and far below the ecliptic plane. And here you can see how that affects the orbits of the various objects that we discover. Now, how many of those trans-Neptunian objects are out there? The estimate is that's probably at least a thousand of them. We just have to find them. They're very difficult to find. They're so far away and typically so small that, can be, that they can be barely detected. And of course, the only way that you know that there's one out there is if you can observe the object over time and see it move relative to the background of stars. If the one object moves slightly across the sky from night to night relative to the stars, then it's probably one of those objects as well. Then we have to try and determine the size of the object, and that's, of course, very difficult to do. But there you get kind of a feel that Pluto is no longer alone. Pluto used to be a lone object out there, no longer considered a planet, but now we realize there's additional ones out there, and we hope to find many, many more of them. So, therefore, they're kind of in a class to themselves. We don't know yet what Pluto looks like. We know that the density is somewhere between the density of ice and the density of rock, so we assume that it's about half rock, half ice, and we assume that many of these other objects fall pretty well in that same category of small objects way out there, a mixture of ice and rock, and we probably don't find a lot of metal in these. And as we said before, we probably expect to find 
at least dozens, if not hundreds, of maybe as well as well over a thousand of these objects. So astronomers can have a, a good time searching for these things for many years to come before we find most of these that are out there. And there we are, the trans-Neptunian objects. <laughs>